Good day, microeconomic students. Professor Lewis here. We've completed consumer's utility models, and now this next video is talking, it's kind of an overview of different production market structures. Some of this is stuff we talked about when we talked about the different types of elasticity of demand and how it affects how steep or flat the demand curve is. But this is something you're going to want to create a table for. So I'm going to start sharing the screen and show you a blank table that we will be making use of here. And so just bear with me for a moment. This table is going to be five columns across left to right, and it's going to be eight rows down top to bottom. The first column is going to be a descriptor column. First row is the proper name. Don't drop any words. You drop a word, you're changing the name, it's wrong. Next row talks about the kind of product that's produced. Different market structures will show different kinds of uh, types of products. Some products are unique. Some products are standardized. Some are differentiated. We'll explain that when we get to them. Number of firms in the market won't be an absolute number, but a range. Some structures have only one seller. Some have just a few big ones. Some have a very large number of very small ones. And that leads to our next item, size of the individual firm relative to the market. We'll talk about percentage of total market output for an individual firm as representing a typical firm for the market. Entry and exit to the market means several things. It could mean startup. For entry. It could be dissolution and bankruptcy for exit. It could mean a uh, business that already exists produces a new product and enters a market it's not producing in before. It could mean a business discontinues a non-profitable type of product. The business still exists, but it no longer produces in that market. It could mean for exit that some firms are merging together. It could mean that one firm is splitting up into two separate firms where one firm is going to basically focus on one line of business. It's going to be separate from the parent firm. So there's all kinds of ways to enter or exit markets is the point. This is how easy or difficult it is relative to other structures. Price control kicks back to price elasticity of demand. Individual businesses degree of price control varies from none to significant to moderate and everything in between. Non-price competition is things like advertising, brand names, logos, jingles, social media campaigns, the type of things that would attract sales that have nothing to do with the price of the product. In fact, we call those shifters of demand non-price determinants of demand because it's not the price of the product whose demand is changing, it's some other attribute related to that product. And so a non-price competition is a means to influence one or more of the non-price determinants of demand. And then, of course, a proper example. Now, the names of our structures, the first one is called perfect competition. If you drop the word perfect, that's not the same thing. It has to be called perfect competition. The next is called monopoly, but there's two variations we will handle in the same column. One is called pure, and the other is called regulated. And where they are different, it will be highlighted. The next structure is called monopolistic competition, and that's not an oxymoron or contradiction in terms. In many ways, monopolistic competition is a bit more like perfect competition. However, it's got some elements of price control that a perfect competition firm will not have. And last but not least, our most diversified, all kinds of variations market structure called oligopoly, a market with just a few large sellers. Some oligopolies are competitive, some are collusive. On top of that, some sell standardized products, some sell differentiated products. In some structures, there's just a few big firms, that's all there are. In others, there's a few big firms that dominate the market that have some little firms to compete with them, but only the big firms constitute an oligopoly. Oligopoly is by far the most complex of the bunch, and also 80% of American gross domestic product comes out of oligopoly. So we're going to zoom in on perfect competition and fill this stuff in first here. So just bear with me a moment while I slide this thing around. For perfect competition, the type of product produced is called standardized. Standardized means everybody is producing the exact same product. There's no means to distinguish one firm's output from another, either artificially or through actual physical means. Everybody produces the same product. Number of firms in the market is described as an extremely large number. 500 is an extremely large number, so is 7,000. But notice hundreds to thousands of firms competing in a perfectly competitive market. The size of the individual firm relative to the market is described as very small. The quantity of output produced by a single firm is less than 1% of Q market. A 100 hectare, which is 250 acres, corn farm is 0.000725% of all the corn produced in North America. It is very small relative to the market. 
Entry and exit to this market is the easiest of all four structures. It is described as very easy, meaning it has a minimal number of, of entry and exit barriers to getting in and out of the market. You still have startup costs. You still have to actually come up with a product and a business plan, but compared to the other structures, it's easiest to actually get started. It's the easiest to get out of as well. Price control possessed by the firm, zero, zip, nada, none. Individual businesses that have absolutely no price control under perfect competition. And the degree of non-price competition does not apply. The reason why non-price competition is considered not applicable here is because everybody produces the same product. Okay, there's no way to distinguish your product from somebody else's. Any spending on non-price competition is spending you should not have to do. It's extra costs that don't gain you that much revenue. So it does not apply here. Examples, your agricultural businesses like corn farms, wheat farms, and dairy farms. And some of y'all remember back from unit number one that they will have a horizontal demand curve for the firm fixed at P star. Now for the monopolies, a market with one large single seller. Okay, some are pure, some are regulated. Monopolies produce a unique product that has very few close subsidies in consumption. The electricity produced by the power plants of NRG is, is one of those products because I dare you to try to live using a natural gas generator. Not doable, too expensive for kilowatt hour, not enough current. Number of firms in the market is only one for a geographic region. Size of the individual firm relative to the market is considered very large. One single firm produces the entire output for the entire market. Entry and exit to the market is blocked. It can be blocked by a legal structure. The government says there can only be one seller. Cost structure, meaning it's too expensive to start up a business relative to the ones that are already there. Economies of scale come into play, or maybe a mixture of both. Price control is significant if it's a true pure monopoly, but if it's regulated, it's moderate because the government steps in and limits their degree of price control. But notice they always have some price control. Non-price competition, also not applicable because Who's your competition if the only seller? Nobody. Examples, your public utility companies like, you know, City of Houston Water and NRG are regulated monopolies. But a lot of tech, tech companies out there, like the folks that have the license for the iPhone, for example, the folks that have the license for Blu-ray technology, they have a business-to-business -business pure monopoly. You can't have a direct-to-consumer pure monopoly, but you can have a business-to-business -business pure monopoly. Monopolistic competition is not a hybrid. It is actually neither perfect competition nor is it monopoly. It is something totally different and the type of product produced is differentiated. Think about blue jeans. Think about fast food. Yes, they are designed to do the same thing, satisfy hunger or cover your lower end quarters, but there's different looks to them, different brands, different seasonings, different styles. Same function, but different in physical or cosmetic details. Number of firms in the market is medium number, 50 to 100 firms. An individual firm is described as being small to medium size, meaning a single firm produces at least 1%, but no more than 5% of the market output. Entry and exit to the structure is easy, but not as easy as perfect competition. There are higher costs to start up. There are higher operating costs. You have to be larger to have more economies of scale, and eggs in the market could run into some other issues there. Now, the degree of price control possessed by the individual firm is said to be moderate. They have some because the product is differentiated. If it was standardized, they'd have none. But having some way to distinguish your output from another, maybe a specialized audience or a specialized group of customers, or maybe like you sell only to one particular area, that's going to give you some price control. Non-price competition is substantial. We have lots of non-price competition because one of the ways you stimulate non-price demand is to advertise. Come up with your brand name, come up with your ad campaigns, come up with contests. All those non-price competitions will attract business and they have a huge benefit in this market. Restaurants at the owner's levels and clothing stores qualify as your monopolistic competition firms. Now, some oligopolies compete, some collude, but an oligopoly is a market that is, pardon me, is characterized by a few large firms that dominate the market. Some oligopolies, like primary aluminum, produce a standardized product. Some oligopolies, like the automobile industry, produce a differentiated product. We bought both kinds. Now, I want you all to notice there's an overlap between size and number of firms because there's two variations. A straight-up oligopoly, as I like to call it, or a, a typical or classical oligopoly has two to 20 firms, and that's all there are, 
Every firm in the market produces at least 5% or more of the market output. We call those large as a result. The dominant firm could have a few big firms that are like gigantic dogs in a pen with a few teacup chihuahuas running around the ends. The teacup chihuahuas are not part of the oligopoly, only the big dogs are. If the biggest four firms produce at least half the market output, the biggest eight produce at least three-fourths, or the biggest 12 produce at least 90%, then just those big firms will constitute an oligopoly in their behavior. So notice there's two variations there by size. There are cost structure barriers to getting in. Economies of scale abound. Businesses that are very large can buy large scale machine technology, which enables more efficient production. The smaller businesses don't have the money to buy that kind of large scale machinery. Exit can be blocked by law. AT&T tried to acquire T-Mobile and the federal government said, no, we're gonna sue you. They like to maintain a market that's competitive when there's an oligopoly and they may block mergers at will. And so the legal barriers can prevent exit. Degree of price control. If the firms collude, like with a cartel, they've got a lot of price control, it's significant. If they don't collude, if they compete, like we see with cell phone service, it's moderate. Now, non-price competition, that depends. It is significant if you have a differentiated product. It is minimal if you have a standardized product. And then last but not least, I have already mentioned several examples here. And so, okay, OPEC is a cartel that produces a standardized product called crude oil. The airlines offer a differentiated service, and there's been evidence of past collusion. Cigarettes are a differentiated product, but again, there's been evidence of past collusion. Primary aluminum and cell phone services, these are more standardized products, so cell phones have some degree of differentiation, but they, okay, are going to be competitive as opposed to collusive. And so this here is a nice little overview of all the structures, and I want you to notice there's a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences. Hopefully this helps clear this all up for you. So, one last thing before we say adios amigo, okay? We're gonna stop screen sharing here. We're gonna be learning about the different types of operations within these firms over the course of the next few weeks here. We're gonna learn about costs, revenues, profits, and losses, and more about economies of scale. We're also gonna talk about rules for production or shutting down, and when it comes to oligopoly strategic behavior. So this is a nice little overview. I hope it's helpful, and I'll talk to y'all later.